Hello everybody, who was I got here at my new desk with a very important video and a serious video. Was Jesus an idol, as some religious groups suppose? This is very important because if Jesus wasn't, and more importantly was who he said he was, that has momentous implications for every individual living on earth. So we're going to be looking straight at the facts, both scripture and history. We're going to be checking the claim that Jesus was an idol. And if you stick with me to the end, I bet you're going to learn something that most people don't know when it comes to this subject. Stuff I didn't know that I learned uh, fairly recently that is really revolutionary. It's like mind, like mind blowing, essentially. So we're going to get right into it. And if we're going to be having a discussion about idols, the first passage to go to is Exodus 20. This is a famous chapter where God gives the Ten Commandments. The first is, you shall have no other gods besides me. And the second, to paraphrase, God says that you shall not make any carved image of anything in the heavens, of anything on the earth, or of anything that is below the earth. In other words, anything that is in the sea. So to sum it all up, God is saying, you shall not make a carved image of anything in creation, because creation is created, and I, the Lord, your man, your exclusive worship. So, by the definition of this passage, because we have to understand what an idol was in the Old Testament context, was Jesus an idol? The answer is no. And the reason is because, in context, an idol is always a carved image. It's always something that's physically built and worshipped apart from Yahweh. Jesus wasn't a physical structure, a carved image that was worshipped in addition to Yahweh, as if there was a pantheon. So, judging by the Old Testament in context and what is defined as an idol, no, Jesus wasn't an idol. See, but the argument is a little more nuanced than that. Those who claim Jesus is an idol, not Christians are idolaters, is because the Bible itself says that God is one. Christians believe in the Trinity. Christians believe in three in one. So, the triune nature, they say, can exist in monotheistic thought. And so we're idolaters because we're worshipping Jesus, who was a man, as God. I'm going to bring you some exceptions. I'm going to answer them. So the first individual says this, that the question is, do Jews... Uh, see Christianity as idolatry and this is what some individuals said yes the main belief of the Jewish religion about God is stated in the Shema Hero Israel Hashem is our God Hashem is one in other words so right there it says that God is one the Trinity states that God is three and he goes on to say that's a non monotheistic belief that's demonstrably false as I'm going to get into a little bit later and he says that God is indivisible, meaning not only is God one, but he doesn't have any plurality in his oneness, in his existence. The second individual says this, observant Jews believe Christianity to be idolatry and paganism. Why? We worship a virgin-born man-god, a god that is intrinsically more than one, but extrinsically one. And then he goes on to talk about the atonement, which we see is prophesied in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, but that's a different subject. He says that the Torah and the Tanakh, that's the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, doesn't support any of these heinous beliefs. So let me take a second to respond to that. These individuals are saying that the idea of a divine Messiah is foreign to the Old Testament and just the existence of God beyond one unit, in other words, no plurality. The verse to go to is Deuteronomy 6. That is sort of causing all this controversy where God tells Israel, Here, or Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The, interestingly, Jesus quotes this in the New Testament as the greatest commandment in the law, the greatest commandment to follow, the one to be held in the highest esteem. But for our purposes, that's besides the point. But we see even Jesus upholding the commandment to worship God exclusively exclusively as the greatest moral imperative but when we look at this verse right here it says that God is one but if you actually examine the Hebrew the word used for one is Ehad instead of Yahid that's significant because the word Ehad is also used for a cluster of grapes 
or even for the unity of a man and a woman, a man and his wife, when they become one flesh. Doesn't mean they're the same person, obviously not. So when you look at the verse in context, God is saying that he is the one true God. He alone deserves worship, but the wording leaves the door open for a plurality of his existence. Not only this, if we actually examine it, um, the Old Testament does present a very complex nature of God. For example, the angel of the Lord. The messenger of the Lord is a, a divine being, in other words, a spiritual being who is presented as being distinct from God, but at the same time being the same as God because, well, he's God's messenger. He speaks as if he has the authority of God and has the authority to forgive sins. So, the angel of the Lord is one example of the complexity of God as presented in the Old Testament. So we all, we all see all these different things coming together, these different nuances and different puzzle pieces that are fully realized in the person of Jesus. So the reality is there's something very interesting to this extent called Jewish Benetarian monotheism. Now this is the part that um, I didn't realize until fairly recently that it's incredibly interesting and Mike Kaiser has done a lot of work on this that we know that in the days of Jesus Jews believed that while there was one God there were two powers in heaven plurality of God's existence and they didn't see it as violating the Shema that's the incredible part about it and these weren't Christians by the way these were Jewish people faithful Jews religious Jews who believed God had a complexity and nuance to his existence now this sounds foreign to many people today, especially many religious Jews today. What you see is in the second century, after the Church of Christ, Yeshua, was already established, this idea became banned in Judaism. But that's already after Christ and his church. Before then, this was a belief that Jews had, faithful Jews, which is something that we don't even realize, but that is true in the historical record. So when the disciples and the first century church um, came to understand who Jesus was and they worshipped him as God uh, this 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 Yeshua this worship of Christ is stepping on into this context so in other words the second power in heaven the one who has even uh, human characteristics we find his identity in the person of Jesus this is sort of how the Jews had this theological framework already in existence that the Christians entered into when they believed Jesus was the Messiah and that it was ultimately God. And we know it's uh, demonstrably true that the belief of Jesus as God goes back to um, the first generation of disciples, the twelve disciples and the Apostle Paul and the earliest Christian writings like 1 Thessalonians. The last individual talks about how the central tenet of Judaism is a unitary deity, indivisible, and numinous. And that is true of modern Judaism. Like I've shown you, ancient Jews believed God did have a plurality to his existence, which goes to show that believing that isn't in contradiction with the Old Testament. The Old Testament even uh, presents that, and ancient Jews believed that, and Christians as well believed that, when they believed Jesus was the Son of God, yet also God. So, he goes on to say that there were a lot of pagan demigods in the ancient world when Christianity was starting to arise. First of all, Christians don't believe in a demigod, but the claim that uh, the twelve disciples, the worship of Jesus came from a pagan concept, paganism, demigods is how the church started worshiping Jesus as God, that doesn't line up with the evidence. When we look at the resurrection beliefs, the origins of the resurrection beliefs, and Inspiring Philosophy did a great video on this, we see that it is so unlike any other major pagan culture to believe in a bodily resurrection, first fruit of the resurrection, that we see that there's no way that the disciples were borrowing from pagan cultures when it came to Jesus because they were convinced in a bodily resurrection of him, which is unprecedented from any pagan culture at the time, and also. Um, how messianic movements worked in that day. People would believe someone was the Messiah. When they would die, the movement would end. But with Jesus and his followers, after he died, the movement skyrocketed. See, so there's something special and different about the Jesus movement than all these other movements. 
and we know that they weren't borrowing from any pagan concepts and we actually look at the evidence the thing is these uh, individuals have a problem with the idea of a divine messiah claiming that the messiah is fully human according to the Old Testament and that's what many modern people modern Jews believe but if we actually look at the Old Testament at face value there are a number of passages that point to the messiah being God one of the greatest examples is Isaiah 9 6 where the root of David is explicitly called mighty God El Gabor now some respond to this in saying this prophecy is about Hezekiah who uh, whose name means mighty but the interesting thing is this one chapter later where the context is about Yahweh the mighty creator it uses the same term El Gabor so mighty God El Gabor is used only two times in the whole Old Testament and in chapter 10 it's explicitly applied to Yahweh the one true God so knowing that it's very striking that a chapter before this term which is used to represent the mightiness of Yahweh is used to refer to a human king that's very striking there are other passages as well but we see all these nuances do present a divine king who is going to come we see these different things fully realized in Jesus. So we see that when we look at the Old Testament, when we look at the Hebrew Bible, and we look at history, the evidence shows that Jesus was not an idol, as some people suppose. The people who know this um, are ignorant of, number one, the Jewish banditarian monotheism, and also that the Bible never teaches that God can't come down in human form. We see this happen in Genesis 18. So when we can establish this, and we can understand that scripturally speaking, Jesus wasn't an idol, then we can look at the Old Testament in an unbiased way, and we see that there's actually a number of things that point to Jesus, not only as the Messiah, but as God. And uh, that's the big project I'm working on, that I have in the works, about how there's a number of things that align exactly with Jesus life foretold hundreds of years before and things that exclusively point to Jesus and really leave Jesus as the only option for the Messiah as promised I adjure you all to watch it I pray it will be a great blessing I'm so excited about this one that I have in the works and that's coming up but as for today in this video was Jesus an idol definitely not God bless